Amen and amen. Somebody came to church. Praise the Lord. How good it is to see you on this Lord's Day. I'm glad that you're here. And I don't know about you, where you were yesterday, but I got lots of rain and loved every bit of it. Praise the Lord. Don't take those things for granted in Texas anymore, do we? You can see the message title is Happily Ever After. I know that some of you think that's only for the fairy tales. Uh, but we're going to look at this today from a God's perspective. Now, we've just finished, what, three, four months long study that we did on the miracles of Jesus, and we've been through that, and it's a great study we shared together. Uh, we're sharing some more information we get into the fall in regard to uh, uh, some more studies. We get into extended series of studies looking at uh, prophecy, end times things, apostasy, the book of Jude, some things like that that we'll be looking at. Uh, I believe that we are very close to those times. But also I want to deal with a couple of just individual sermons before we get into these next series. I think that will be pertinent to where we are. And obviously this is one of them. Now you may be here today and maybe you're divorced, maybe you're married, maybe you're not married, maybe you're thinking about being married, maybe you wish you weren't married. I don't know. But wherever you are in this process, especially if you are married, that uh, if you follow a biblical marriage, by the way, the Bible does say a lot about this. It's amazing what God can do in your home. Now, it doesn't exempt you from having some problems within your marriage, but it certainly will give you the grounds on which to stand and uh, find success in your marriage. If you're here as a single person today, these are some things you need to take very careful notes on. In fact, <clears throat> when I get in this message, I'm going to give you 15 points. Now, a, a lot of people would pay a lot of money and do pay a lot of money to get these 15 points. I'm giving them to you for free. Now go ahead. I mean, I would clap. That's worth clapping over. Take good notes and you might be able to charge somebody for these 15 points. It's that good. These 15 points are just practical things from a biblical perspective and a Christian marriage of what should be happening in the confines of anybody's relationship that would call itself Christian. So let's, obviously, if we're going to approach it from that particular standpoint, I used to have a little remote thing, there it is. Then uh, let's go to the, to the Word of God and let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians, Paul's been given this theme of being in Christ. And obviously, if we're in Christ, we want our relationships to be in Christ. And he's wrapping up this particular portion of the Scripture he says, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And wives, you be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband's the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, a lot of people, when they look at this particular passage of Scripture, go right over it. I know pastors who won't go into this particular passage of Scripture because it mentions the S word. You don't know what the S word is, don't you? Submit. But I want you to notice when we read that a while ago, we started out with verse 20. It says, we give all thanks. We give, we give thanks for all things in the name of our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ, and we are subject to... We are submitting to one another in the fear of God. So he starts out with, first of all, we're all submitting to Christ and we're all submitting to each other. I don't know why people have such a hard word with submit. It's a great word because in that word is found the, uh, is the power to find authority for your life, protection for your life, God's grace on your life. If you're a Christian, you cannot succeed in your spiritual walk and in your journey unless you know this word submit. Because we are submitting to Christ as Lord. And in submitting to Him, we find favor, we find blessing, we receive salvation. We have the Holy Spirit come and inhabit our lives. We, 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 we uh, believe the Word of God because this Holy Spirit inhabits our lives. So uh, there's just, you're not going anywhere without the, the S word, all right? And then he talks about in a relationship that first we're submitting ourselves one to another. 
We're submitting ourselves to God. Husbands are submitting themselves to their husbands as a leader in the home, and, and husbands are loving their wives. And, and so it's, it's not so you know, difficult when you realize that this is where the, it, it, it's the path. It's the, the process whereby we discover the power and the peace of God on our life. So don't be afraid of that word, all right? It's a good word. Now, as much as wives sometimes will back off from that word, husbands back off from the other word, the L word for love. You know, husbands love your wives. You know, and that doesn't just mean say I love her. It means love your wife. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But I thought there were some, some uh, startling statistics that I wanted to show you. One is from, from a study called Cheating Spouses, all right? And... Uh, it goes like this, the statistics that confirm that 50 to 70% of married men, about between 38 and 53 million men, have cheated or will cheat on their wives. I don't know if that bothers you or blows you away, it does me. And then it goes on to say, from another study, that two thirds of the wives of these 26, 36 million wives out there, they had no idea their husbands were cheating on them. Largely because they just failed to recognize obvious signs that were there. There was another study put out by an author named Peggy Vaughn, and she wrote a book called The Monogamy Myth, Monogamy Myth that was published twice, once in 89 and once again in 2003. And she made this, she said, uh, get to the next study here. She, she made this statement, conservative infidelity statistics estimate that 60% of men and 40% of women will have an extra marital affair. Now that's back in 2003. We're talking about a decade ago, all right? When you, when you look at where we are, the adultery statistics of, the, of these things that we just mentioned, we're talking 10 years or more back. So if you take the changes that have happened culturally in our society during especially the last 10 years have been crazy and the, the technical leaps and the cultural changes have been phenomenal, they estimate that probably those who are involved in affairs is somewhat higher. In fact, some say as much as you know, for women, 60% of women are cheating on their husbands as well as 60% of, of men are cheating on their wives. And that is not the way God intended it, by the way. When God created Adam and Eve and united them and developed the first family and the first marriage and the first home and told them to, be, uh, to, to, to multiply and to, you know, to have children and inhabit the earth and uh, to take authority and to be stewards over the earth. Uh, the idea of infidelity was not in the mind of God. The idea of a man cheating on his wife or a woman cheating on her husband was nowhere found in the heart or the mind of God. In fact, as you study scripture hundreds of years ago by before you even see it mentioned in the law of Moses, Jesus made reference later to it when he said, Moses gave this writ of divorce because of the hardness of your hearts. So Jesus kind of puts it in, in picture that people cheat on each other and people get divorced because they have hard hearts. Bottom line. I mean, a lot of people have lots of reasons. They can give you a list. They can go down the list. They can clarify and, and give all the justifications on their list. But in reality, it says, you know, it happens because people have hard hearts. Every divorce that takes place, one of the couple or both in that couple have hard hearts. They won't let God be God. They won't allow the word of God to shape their life. They won't allow the spirit of God to work in their heart and their life. And unfortunately, they're not experiencing the relationship that God wants them to have. God gave us a picture of his love and his, 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 his care. He gave it to us in, in the form of his own son, the church being the bride of Christ, Jesus giving up his life for the bride, doing everything he can possibly to strengthen us and love us and give us gifts and encourage us and send his Holy Spirit in our lives. It's, it's amazing what Christ has done for us as people. And, and the, God says the same way that that relationship works is the way I want it to work in your home. That there's the church respects and honors the Lord Jesus, that a wife would do that for her husband. And as the, as the Lord loves his bride sacrificially, then, then a man would do that for his wife. In fact, he, he wraps it up in Ephesians chapter five and in the last verse of Ephesians chapter five, he says, just here it is on the bottom line. He says, see to it that a man loves his wife and a wife would respect her husband. In fact, several years ago, you know, there was a book that came out called Love and Respect. And on top of that, we used the material for one of our marriage retreats one year called Love and Respect. That is the ideal biblical marriage. That's the best marriage where the people understand the context of loving and respecting. That there's this love that's granted. There's this respect that's given. And this, this is nothing new. This is the biblical 
This is the biblical model. This is the biblical principle that God gives us. And even, even better than that is this. That if we are born again, as Ephesians has written to us, with a context that we are in Christ, we're new creatures, we're new people, we're not what we used to be. Therefore, because we are in Christ, we have the capacity to experience this love and respect relationship. But that does not I think characterize many of the marriages that are in homes today. In fact, most of them can be described as what I call the worst type is the hate and resist marriage. People just, you know, they just, they're just coping with one another. They're just getting along with each other. There's no real expression of love and no real expression. You know, the hate and resist marriage, you have a wife that's always nagging her husband and a husband that's always showing disrespect and, and, and not loving his wife and sarcasm kind of fills the air on both parts. It's not what God wants in a marriage. The second type, I think, worst marriage is the, is the hate and submit marriage. You know, the hate and submit marriage is interesting. The hate and submit marriage is the, is the picture of, the, uh, of a husband who's not really loving his wife, but a wife who's submitting anyway. A husband who's doing his own thing, following his own rules, not submitting his life to Christ. You know, his heart's not right with God. But, she, you know, I, I kind of think, and, and some of you are old enough to remember these, this couple, the, the Edith and Archie Bunker. Some of y'all remember them, don't you? That's a good picture of, the, of that hate and submit, you know. He just, he, he didn't want to be bothered. He had his own life going. He had his own world he lived in. And she's just there trying to love and submit and do all these things. And, but that's a picture of a lot of relationships today. A, a third type of bad marriage I put down uh, kind of is, is not as bad as that one, but it's still bad. It's the love and resist marriage. Now, this happens especially... I think it's more predominant in the culture we're living in because we have so many couples that are both working and they're both out in the work fields, you know, and, and they're, they're trying to, to, to make enough money to get by. And, and, and so they kind of, this is the kind of marriage you see on TV a lot. They, they just kind of cope with each other, you know. They, 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 there's, there's kind of, there's this love relationship, but this, it's not really, you know, uh, where God wants it to be. And we just kind of get along with each other. It's ch cheaper to live this way than to get a divorce and on and on it goes. But this, these are not the kind of marriages that God has in mind for you. When you study the scriptures and you concentrate on what the Bible says, you begin to see that God has something completely different in, in, in line for your marriage. If you're, if you're here today and say you're, even as a teenager, this day's probably going to come when you're going to get married. You need to look at this model that, that scripture gives us. You need to look at what the Bible says and say, that's the goal I'm going to set. That's the kind of relationship I want to have. In fact, now, these 15 points, even though they're free to you today, I had to study. And, uh, and, but I, I, kind of, I plagiarized all 15 points. There's nothing original here with me. And by the way, there's nothing new under the sun anyway. If anybody says they thought of themselves, they're lying. God put everything in order. But I did, I did get these, these 15 points from W.A. Criswell. Some of y'all may remember Dr. Criswell. He was the, uh, the pastor for many, many years, the First Baptist Church in Dallas, and one of the first mega churches that in First Houston, I guess, that were out there. Uh, a, just a great man of God. And he released this, 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 this sermon, I guess it was late 80s, you know, that he, and he just kind of got for his congregation and shared these 15 points to have this, the happily ever after kind of marriage. So I'm going to give you those 15 points today, and we, because of the time factor, we're not going to labor a lot on each point. So take good notes because I think that you'll want to go back. Now, this is especially for those of you that are sitting there right now with your arms crossed, kind of looking at me, thinking, what are we going to talk about this for? You, you know, you think you have it all together and your marriage is just perfect, but you haven't asked your spouse about that. <laughs> you know, the, you think it's okay, but they might not think it's okay. So there's a learning here that can take place. There's some growing here that can take place. There's some maturity here. So I want you to pay attention to whatever it might be that the Lord might say to you as we, as we look at these 15 points. Here's the obvious first one. Above all things, as you look at the happily ever after marriage, the most important is, is that you make God your friend and your confidant. The Bible says in Proverbs, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Well, who is that friend? Ultimately, if you're a wise person, as Proverbs hopes that you will learn wisdom from, that you'll gather wisdom, your best friend is going to be God himself and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Even Jesus said, I don't call you my servants or my slaves, I call you my friends. Because the best friend is, 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 is found in Christ, and if I can embrace that concept and believe that concept, then I can begin to experience what I need to experience in my own personal life. Because if I'm not right with God, and I, I'm not, my friendship relationship's not right with God, and I'm going to have trouble on every other level. Remember the parable about Jesus said the man who built his house on the sand and the man who built his house on the rock? 
How the man who built his house on the rock, his merit, his life, his goals, his business, everything. he succeeded in life. But the rock was those who would be wise enough to hear the words of Jesus and do them. In other words, if I'm willing to embrace Christ, believe his word, and obey him, it's amazing what God will do on my part, regardless of storms and difficulties and problems. Now, a lot of people don't have good friendships. The Bible talks about bad friendships and what it can do to your life. And if you don't have good friendships, you know, in fact, if you, if you have friends that aren't really biblically smart, you know, they may be worldly wise, but when it comes to scripture, the principles of God's words, they don't know it and they don't comprehend it because a lot of it doesn't make sense. And you go to them as your friend for counsel. Guess what? You're not going to get good counsel. And the best friend you can get counsel from is the Lord God or his son, allowing the Holy Spirit to interpret the word of God to you. That's going to be the best counsel you can get because he will stick close to the brother. He's not a fair weather friend. He's not going to come and go when things are good or things are bad. He's just there all the time. And in your life, you're going to have times when you need to talk to a friend. When you're going to need to confide in a friend, that friend needs to be first and foremost, the Lord Jesus Christ. Second of all, is equally important, is you need to understand love from the God perspective. You start with the definition from what God says. In the Greek world, when the New Testament was given to us, the most predominant word that was used for love in the Greek language was the word eros, or some derivative of it. We get the fact, we get the word erotic from it, but it didn't always describe some kind of sensual erotic love. It was just a, it was a term used in general for like romance or, or I love you, but it was the general term that people used. Now, there were some other Greek terms. There's one phileo, which we talk about brotherly love. We get the word philanthropist from, you know, philanthropical. It's a love for humanity. There was another word about uh, family love. In other words, a, a love that a family demonstrates for one another. It was the word storge. All right, the Bible says in the last days that people will be, you know, without, without natural affections. And part of that was they, they won't understand the love for husband and wife and father and mother. They'll be without, it's a negative participle. It's ah, like atheist without God, atheist, somebody to believe God. It's astorgy, without natural family love. Boy, that's certainly what's happened in our world as well today. We see these in the times. But the biblical word, which God reached down into the Greek culture of the day, the predominant culture, the language of the day, and God pulled out a word for describing his love, which wasn't, a, a, it was a, wasn't used a whole lot. It was the word agape. The Bible says that God is love. All right? That God is agape love. God is that highest kind of love. It's the, it's the word that, that describes God. 1 John 4, 18 says, God is love. In the Greek, it's otheos agape estan, which means that God is agape love. This is the kind of love in Ephesians 5, it says, husbands, agapeo, agape your wife. Love him with a godly love. I wrote a book, many of you know, many years ago called Love, Lust, and Romance. And the title for this agape love that we gave in there was, 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 had to do with the idea of sacrifice. It's, it's, it's you being concerned no matter what the cost are to you, for someone else's highest good. That the love relationship that you would have is not about you, it's about the person you love. It's not what you give me, what I get it, how you make me feel. And that's where most people's love relationships begin. I mean, a guy looks at a girl and says, oh man, she's good looking. You know, she makes me feel crazy in love. I'm, I'm in love. Or the girl, she looks, oh man, he's just so dreamy. I just love him, you know, I think I'm in love. That's not agape love, all right? That's not genuine. That's not the love that makes a relationship work. That's the love that's shown on TV and in the movies, isn't it? That's the love the world has. But it doesn't know anything about sacrifice. It doesn't think about real commitment. It doesn't know anything about giving up something. It doesn't know about hurting for somebody and loving them no matter what the cost is. You're staying with it and you're caring about them and you're concerned not about your highest good, but you're concerned about their highest good. And if you're going to have a good relationship in marriage, it's going to have to have that kind of understanding of the truest definition of agape or love and what it really means. The third is this. Bestow words of appreciation lavishly on each other. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. That's just, you know, I don't know about you, I just, I just, that is so poetic, that is so, you know, beautiful, the way it's just laid out there. It's just, it's just, and God says, your words to other people are like that. It's just, it's like gold, it's like silver. Proverbs also says that words that aren't, you know, words of appreciation, words that are sarcastic, words of cynicism, words of anger, words of, it says they go down and they wound us. 
So words, we know, have tremendous power. And, and they can destroy or they can lift up or they, they can help. What you need to do in your relationship, instead of looking for fault and shall always bring about fault, what the other person does wrong, start looking for something else. Start looking for a way to compliment. Start looking for a way to praise. Start looking for a way to encourage. Just praise him and encourage him and keep on doing it. Don't be like the guy when his wife came into. He didn't like the way she cooked. He never encouraged the way she cooked. She came in one day and says, Honey, you know, I'm so sorry. The dog ate the biscuits. To which he replied, <clears throat> Don't worry, honey. We'll get another dog. You'll get that in a minute. <laughs> Words that lift up. Words that encourage somebody. And add to that, number four would be this. Never criticize your spouse in public no matter what. I mean, your husband may be a pygmy, but you brag on him, you surround him with such praise, you talk to other people about him, and he will grow in stature, and not only in other people's eyes, but in your eyes. You encourage. And the hardest thing that you've got to teach young couples many times is a simple principle, that when they're sitting around with their friends and they're making jokes and they're laughing, that you're not making jokes at the expense of your wife or your husband. Because it may be funny in the moment, but somebody is not laughing on the inside and it's cutting them up. It never, ever works. Some people do it as a manipulative thing to get their way. They'll, 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 they'll be cynical about their spouse in public. It doesn't work. It's only going to destroy the relationship. Number five. This is good. Treat her or him after you marry them as you did when you were courting. Y'all remember those days when you were trying to get each other's attention? When you just waited for the doorbell to ring, when you waited for him to drive up, or you waited to see her, you know, you checked your breath, <laughs> what it smell like. It's the last thing you do now in the world, you walk up with onions and garlic and just try to kiss her at that point. You, you took a bath. <laughs> you put a little cologne on. You smelt a little bit. You looked a little better. So, you know, if just, you know, what were you wearing yesterday? Just go back in your mind and look in the mirror. What was that? Some of you know what I'm talking about. You were there, okay? <laughs> Just a matter of where you peeled each other, where you looked at each other. You know, and I know you probably think Kathy and I don't have a real relationship. But you know, one thing about appreciate my wife, she gets up before I do just to get her hair done and her makeup on before I see her. She's out of her mind. But I love it. You know, it's just that, that's, that's the way people do before they get married. Let's try to continue that after you get married. See what that does for your relationship. Number six, since you're listening so fast. You can read that. Simple thing of just taking notice. The Lord does this for all, all the time. You know? He just does things for us all the time. And sometimes, if you're paying attention to what God's up to in your life, he just surprises you, doesn't he? Remember the story of Ruth and Boaz, when Boaz, you know, Ruth was gleaning the outside of Boaz's fields when she came into to the land, and, and, you know, she was a stranger, and they were out, but you, according to the law, you had to let the strangers glean from the sides of your fields, and, and uh, he saw her out there, and he, he told his workers, leave a little bit out there on purpose. Not just what would normally be, active. do something special on purpose. When's the last time you just did something on purpose? Just surprise. Oh, we can't afford that. It's not a waste of money when you're spending it on each other. When you're enhancing and building your relationship, just take time, you know, to do something uniquely special. But some people have forgotten about that altogether. They're just no longer doing it. And they're missing the blessing that they could have. So plan a little kindness and a little surprise along the way. Number seven. Place the other person's good and happiness above everything else. That's what agape love is. Be kindly affectionate to one another in honor, catch this, preferring one another. That's life transforming. Preferring one another. That I would put you before me. That you would put your spouse, your husband, your wife before you. That's the way it works. This is the way God intended it. And this is the way scripture leads us to do. That if we do that, guess what happens? Great things begin to happen in your life. May not happen today, may not happen next week, but I want you to know, you continue to plant those kinds of seeds in your life, the fruit that comes up is going to be a blessing. 
Scriptural principle is simple. You reap what you sow. Whatsoever, it says in Galatians, that a man sows, that will he also reap. If you reap to your selfishness and to your flesh, all you're going to get is corruption. If it's all about you, it's just going to end in misery. But if you can follow these biblical principles of putting someone over you, above you, and be concerned about their lives and their commitment and where they are in their life, that you love them, it's amazing what God will do in your life because you will reap the benefits of that long and a long, long time. Number eight, talk and discuss things together. What does that mean? Talk and listen. Now, some people are good at talking, but they're not good at listening. I have some people that come in here and here or come to church, and maybe you know people like this. They come in, and they're good at talking, but they don't hear what you say. In fact, I, I'm just the kind of weird person. When people start talking to me like that, I just interrupt and throw something just totally off the wall of the conversation that has nothing to do with what they're talking about and see if they respond to it. And you'd be surprised, 90% of people don't even hear it. Or maybe they're just afraid to respond to it. They just don't, don't, it's, it's a, I've got something I need to say, I'm going to say it. You don't, I don't care if you're listening, I'm just going to say it anyway, kind of thing. And they just, <laughs> and you just sit there and smile. Next time they just say something really stupid. You know, it's like the sun's not going to set this week. Anything, it'll work. See if they respond. It's good for people to just stop every once in a while. You know, it's, it's like, remember the old commercial? You know, I'm falling and I help. I'm falling, I can't get up. He said, help, I'm talking and I can't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be that person. If you're going to have a good marriage, if you're going to have a good job, if you have a good life, you have to be the kind of person that will listen. Listen, you know, there's a lot of people today who make good money just listening. People pay money just to have somebody listen to them. It's amazing. Listen, how about you be the person in life like that that's a listener? Yeah, I know you've got all the answers. So do I. We all do. But sometimes it's good to let someone talk and listen to what they're saying and be the one who listens and learns what it means in a marriage relationship, especially to communicate. And so often that is not what happens. You have to talk and discuss and talk about things together. Number nine, and this is important. Never speak or air a problem of your family outside your home. Unless it's with trusted spiritual friends or trusted spiritual counsel. Your family issues aren't the world's problems. And by the way, I hate to tell you this, they don't care. And this has become a big danger in the culture that we're living in. I see this come across more ways than you can imagine. Emails, Twitter, Facebook. Shame on you if you're the person who puts on Facebook all your personal problems within your family or your marriage or your parents. You've seen it. I've seen it. It's pitiful. That's, that's not the place to air your problems. I take my problems to where my problems are. I deal with my problems where my problems are. I find resolution where the problems are. I don't go out and spread it out there. I've mentioned this before, even in, in conferences where we do our, our marriage seminar. Here's the way it works. You take your problems outside the home. And many times it starts with a young couple. You know, they're, they're just pretty much recently married and everything's good, you know, and the honeymoon's happen, and a few months go by and then they start learning what it means to live together. All right, and how to work with problems and deal with each other because they are different more so than what they even imagined. All right, and so instead of learning how to co communicate, they run to their mama. Mama, you want know what he said about me? I didn't like why I burnt the toast and didn't give you whatever it might be. So you start doing this pretty much repetitively, and your mama's looking for a divorce lawyer for you. Because <laughs> her little baby's been offended. And by the way, the baby was not the one you say, it wasn't the wife, it was the husband doing it to his mama. So anyway. <laughs> And, and all of a sudden, you know, they, now, now what's happened in the meantime, mom and dad are mad at your spouse. Over here, you've made up. Yeah. You're in happily love land. Okay. You know, everything's marvelous with you guys. 
And next time you go over to see your parents, they're just ready to kill your spouse. <laughs> Why don't you love him? Why don't you accept him? Because you told us what a slob he was. <laughs> Keep your problems within the house. Take them to people you know that are godly if you're going to say something to someone else about them and learn how to grow up and deal with the issues. All right? You know, it was all right when you went to mommy because you, you know, got a scratch and a little bobo on your knee. But now that you're an adult and a grown person, fix your own bobo. <laughs> deal with it. Find resolution. Seek restoration. Find re reconciliation. But not outside. Number 10. Thrust anger far from you. Ephesians 5 says, be angry and sin not. I always love to hear people tell me something like this. Here's where it goes. Pastor, you know, we've been married 38 years. Our marriage is perfect. We don't argue. How I many y'all have people tell you that? We don't argue. Y'all had couples tell you that before. They are lying through their teeth. <laughs> we, don't, we don't ever share harsh things. It might, they may live at different ends of the house, maybe. I don't know. Everybody experiences this emotion called anger. James says, when you don't get your way, you get mad. Chapter 4, verse 1. We don't get our way, we get mad. Where do wars come up? He said, you're not getting your way. And so we have this little war breakout. The thing about it is, you, you, you can be angry but not sin. Now that comes by the capacity of the Holy Spirit who lives in you now. You don't have to let it end in a, in a, in a major battle. You can, you can embrace grace. You can, you can practice patience. You can practice self-control now. You can watch your words now. God gives you the power to do all those things. So now I can take my anger when I experience it and, hey, not respond to it and not let the sun go down on my wrath. That's probably some of the best counsel anybody ever gave me before I got married. Don't go to bed angry. How many of y'all got that counsel? It was good counsel, wasn't it? How, how many of y'all had late nights? <laughs> some late nights, wasn't there? Before you went, it might be 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning before you got to bed. But it's great because anger, if it's allowed to fester us, it is like a disease. It's poisonous. It's cancerous. It will destroy the relationship. So get rid of anger. Number 11, never live beyond your means. And this is the world we live in with the, with the age of, of cash and versus credit. You know, my wife and I have been married close to 40 years. And in 40 years, we've gotten some nice stuff. But we didn't have nice stuff the first 30. <laughs> Takes time. And so many couples, they get married today and they want everything that mom and dad have the first week of marriage that mom and dad didn't get till 25, 30 years later. And so what do they do? They go out and they charge. Get the credit cards out. I got a Lowe's card. I got a Home Depot card. I got a Sears card. You know, I, 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 hey, I've even got a Sonic card, I think. You know, I've got, I've, I got a MasterCard. I got a Visa card. I've got, a, I got an AmeriExpress card. I've got a, I got a bank card. I, I, I've got a card for every retail outlet in the world. I got a Ross's card. I got a Kohl's card. I got, get rid of your cards. Simply put, cut them up. Let's say it together. Cut them up. If you get drowning in debt, you're going to destroy your marriage. The number two problem in marriage is money. And people are living well beyond their means. And the Bible says, don't do it. Don't owe people stuff, but love. Don't let the world, don't let the world capture you with this materialistic spirit. You think you've got to have stuff. Stuff doesn't make you happy. People will make you happy. Your wife can make you happy. Your husband can make you happy. When you begin to invest your life in the right places, you get the right responses. Number 12, work and strive to make your intimate life beautiful. Now, husbands and wives, I don't think I need to draw this out lengthily, but we're talking about your intimate life. Now, I try to talk to my children about this, and they act embarrassed. They're grown adults. I tell my children, where do you think you came from? <laughs> I didn't find you under a rock. Sometimes I'd have put you back if I had. <laughs> but this is an important part of your life. Scriptures talk about this. You say, I uh, want to you so Just read the Song of Solomon. See the beautiful, intimate relationship between a man and a woman and what it can be, and it should be a beautiful experience to be enjoyed. Sex is not a dirty word. 
All right? It's a righteous word in the right place. But the right place is marriage. And let me go beyond that and say, it's marriage between a man and a woman. Amen. Lest we forget that in the culture where everything is so acceptable today. So what are we going to do? We're going to obviously seek to make this part of our life important. Well, you know, I've just, you know, I don't, you know, it's, I, then get over it. And get right with God in this regard to your family and your life. Number 13, center your marriage in the Lord in the church. I'm not just going to say the church because the Lord, this is the Lord's church. We are his bride. Church needs to be important to you. And you need to teach that it's important to your children. You need to make it a focal point of your life. And many of you had experienced the blessing of that. But there's a lot of people who hadn't really got this just yet. There's a lot of couples, you know, that, 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 that have started their marriages and church is not a real important focal part of their life. You need it now, especially at this part of your marriage, then even more later on. I mean, there's going to be difficulties you're going to face, and you're going to wish you had a church family which you could lean on, rely on, and have that rel relationship and the fellowship that comes from a biblical, solidly based fellowship of God's people. You need that, and you need to center, make it a very important part of your life. Sunday ought to be fun day. Sunday ought to be exciting. We're going to church today. Hey, and by the way, I got a better idea. We're going to church on time. Because why? Because it's important. Well, it's not important to me. Jesus died for the church. If it's important to him, it ought to be important to us. He died for the church. Let's make it important in our life. Number 14. You read that, didn't you? There are people in relationships where one, or sometimes both, of the spouse are very lazy. And this is especially important about accepting responsibility in the culture of living where we have two working people in a home anymore. Husband and wife both working. You've got to share the responsibility. This idea was her job, his job. You know, well, you can discuss what those are and make sure everybody agrees, but everybody's doing something. You know, you share the load. If your wife works, you, you know, as well, then you share the responsibilities that are out there. That's a lot of work to go to work and to come home and work too, all right? So everybody gets on board and everybody does something. Everybody's participating. Everybody's helping. But there's a lot of people today who have a struggle in their marriage because somebody is lazy. I'm retired. Not from life. <laughs> Maybe from the job, but you don't retire from living. You don't retire from your marriage. You share the responsibilities. Not one person should be carrying the whole load. And number 15, which I'm sure some of you are glad to get to, is you need to learn how to praise God because he will deliver you through every trial. When you think there is no hope, guess what? The hope of glory. Jesus is there and he's present and he's in your life. When you think things are the darkest, he can turn them into the brightest. When things seem to be the most despairing, God can make those most despairing moments some of the most precious moments of all. You can see the grace of God. This, this thing called marriage is one of the most endearing and precious journeys that you get to participate in. And some of those who have had a long time and had the journey and now perhaps one of their spouses is missing, they can tell you very clearly what sometimes we overlook. We don't take these relationships for granted. God's blessed us with us. And any day that can all change. And any day it's a different story. So you should be enjoying the journey, but you do that by realizing that, hey, whatever comes, we're going to get through it because we're going to trust God together in this. We can believe God. What are we going to, I don't know, but we're going to believe God. Things are difficult. That's all right. We're going to make it. How are we going to make it? I don't know. But God said he committed himself to us. So we can look to him and we can believe him. We can trust him. And this is the beauty of Christian relationships of a man and a woman, both committed to Jesus Christ and trusting him and looking to him. Listen, young people, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not marry somebody that doesn't love Jesus. Amen. That's all you get out of this sermon as a young person. They get that down. Life is hard enough. It's just difficult. 
And when you marry somebody that loves Christ, not going to mean they're going to be perfect. They're going to make mistakes as well. But hey, you know that God is in control and he knows how to deal with his children and he knows how to deal with that individual. And he can, he can do what needs to be done in their lives. But when you're both seeking to please God, man, what a beautiful relationship that can be and what a joyous journey. It's, it, it gets more exciting day by day. In fact, the day before yesterday, I turned to Kathy and I said, you know, 38 years we've been married. Yeah. I said, amen, that's a compliment for some. But I said, aren't you getting a little bored with me now? I get, you know. She said, well, you getting bored with me? I said, no. I, who'd ever be bored with you? But I can imagine you'd be bored with me. It could get boring after a while. To which she just went to sleep. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> we just talked about all the blessings and God, how the grace of God has been poured in our life and the, you know, the God given us family and God given us kids that love Jesus and you know, grandkids and the beauty of that and the blessing of that and the journey with Jesus. You know, even through the rough times, even through our own personal failures in, in life, it's just grace and grace and grace. But you look around at so many people that follow those statistics who are not learning what it means to enjoy life and marriage the way God intended to be, and they're foolish people who build their lives on sand when you don't have to have that kind of life. Life shouldn't be filled with a bunch of regrets. It should be filled with some glorious memories and grace of God present in your life. Get your heart right with God. Get your life right with God. Get your marriage right with God. We, we do these marriage conferences, you know, every October. Y'all have heard about those, haven't you? And some of you think, you can do them every year, every year. Why do you do it? Because we never always get it all down. If anybody in this room has arrived and what it means to be that perfect spiritual spouse, would you please fly around the room at least once for us? I didn't think so. We haven't. It's a constant journey. It's a constant growing. The apostles in several books, from Peter to Paul, said, stir up their minds by way of remembrance. Remind people about their walk. Remind people about their commitments. Remind people about their homes. Remind people to pray. Remind people Jesus is coming. Remind them. That's why we continually seek to encourage families and homes and marriages. If you think your marriage has arrived, you're on dangerous ground. The Bible says, when you think you're standing, take heed lest you fall. Pride's a very dangerous thing, especially in our marriages. You can always use the encouragement. You can always use the ministry. You can always use the word. You can always use the reminders that we need to be committed to one another totally and love each other. We'll see the grace of God work in our families and work in our lives. And we can have a happily ever after. Now, Sands not be filled with some problems, difficulties, and crises, and maybe in failures. But we can seek the grace of God to reconcile and restore so that we can rejoice as His people. I encourage you to take these simple points that we've shared today. Go down that list in your own life. See where you're failing. See where you're succeeding. Be wise enough to measure yourself time to time with the Word of God. See where you are. Make the adjustments that need to be made. Get right with God where you need to get right with God and see what God will do in your life. Would you stand with your heads bowed today?